On a personal level, I feel a great deal of pride in my association with the Marine Corps. There are many times in my life when I looked in the mirror when the rest of the world was going to shit, I said, at least I'm a Marine, that's something that'll get me through the day. Well, in many respects, it's an experience you'd have to go through to fully appreciate, but uh, I definitely attribute that to the majority of my character, whether it's good or bad, is the years that I spent in the Marine Corps and the challenges that I faced and overcame while being a Marine. Well, this specific one, I don't know that there's anything special that differentiates from any other Marine Corps birthday, but on the occasion of the Marine Corps birthday, we reflect upon the guidance we got from our 13th Commandant General John Archer Lejeune about how we separate, celebrate that particular tradition, which has come to involve a ball and a birthday cake, which is cut and the slice is given to the youngest and the oldest Marine presence. And of course, when they play the Marines hymn and other patriotic airs, you just uh, makes you stand a little taller and feel a little more pride about being a United States Marine. All right, and uh, a little bit more history than you might want to hear at this point, but uh, it'll put it all in perspective. You have to consider the world situation as the 1930s drew to a close. And of course, World War II started in 1939. We didn't get involved in 1941. But during that particular period, the world was literally aflame. Germany had invaded and occupied Poland, France, the Benelux countries, Norway. Uh, Japan had invited China. Britain had barely survived from annihilation at uh, Dunkirk. And as the world progressed into 1941, Germany continued its occupation of Yugoslavia, Greece, Crete. Germany, Romania, Italy had invaded Russia. Italy had invaded Egypt. And uh, Japan was running through Indochina. The United States at that particular point was just becoming to realize that they were in peril. Their armed forces, which are in a, such a depleted state that they were incapable of not only of not in any way contemplating a belligerent role in the war, but they couldn't even defend their own shores. In fact, prior to Pearl Harbor, 80% of the American public was opposed to intervention in the war. Pearl Harbor changed all that. But the, the Joint Army-Navy Board, which was the predecessor of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, had come up with a strategy on the American role in the war. It's called the Rainbow Series of War Plans. How this gets to the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps' role in this was to develop two Marine divisions, one on each coast, whose task would be through a series of preemptive occupations and reinforcements protect vital American interests in the Atlantic and Caribbean which would entail Iceland, the Azores, Cape Verde Islands, Panama Canal, French Vichy held Martinique, and most importantly, create two marine divisions, one on each coast, the East Coast Division being tasked with constituting one half of an amphibious corps, which would eventually affect a forceful entry on the European and African continents to reclaim them from Axis domination. So the Marine Corps, looking to the East Coast, needed a division. The problem was, at that point, the Marine Corps had no divisions and certainly not a base in which to train that division. The ground forces which constituted the Fleet Marine Force at that particular point, in fact, were smaller than the Metropolitan New York Police Department. So the Major General Commandant, General Holcomb, had an impressive task in front of him. On the East Coast, he had to find a place 
to train a 15,000 man Marine Division. And then he had to constitute that division. Both of them, of course, ha they happened concurrently. He had to have a place to train that division. So he called two aviators up from Quantico and he said, fly up and down the eastern Gulf Coast from Norfolk to Corpus Christi, Texas. Find us a base. They did this during the summer of 1940. Every time they overflew the New River area, they looked down and looked at it and said, this looks to be the place the Commandant needs. He needed approximately 100 square miles to maneuver large formations, fire heavy weapons. The area had to be uh, close to a deep water port and had to be unobstructed by public roads, habitation, and industry, which pretty well defined eastern North Carolina, Onslow County. And they told the Commandant, this is the area that you want. The Commandant concurred, so did the Secretary of the Navy, the President of the United States, and the Congress appropriated $1.5 million in February of 1941 to survey and inquire a site for an East Coast Marine training base. And also, concurrently, they stood up, at least on paper, the 1st Marine Division. And the 1st Marine Division was the 1st Marine Division as opposed to the 2nd Marine Division. So we had a base. And one of the other things that was very important uh, when they were looking down on New River, New River area had unobstructed beach of 19,000 yards, which was the only place on the entire East Coast where they could land two divisions abreast and they could maneuver, maneuver inland. So that was the basis for the site. And of course, the other general reasons, the South in general and Eastern North Carolina had a lower cost of land, a less population density, um, a readily available workforce, and a better climate than other places they looked at. So that meets all the criteria that you wanted to build an East Coast Marine Corps training center. And that's how the Marines got here. The First, geography was very important. And everything else, the infrastructure, right. the presence and absence of it. And there's a lot of political factors involved. Moorhead City was an underused works progress administration deep water port that was underused and the Democrats wanted to succeed. So they were anxious. And you had the governor, J. Melville Broughton, who was anxious to get the Marines here for the obvious economic benefits. And you also had a very powerful congressman, Graham Barden, irrepressible, irresistible. He in greatly influenced the president in getting another military installation in his district, the third congressional district. Raleigh tells me that there were more installations in North Carolina in his third district than any other place in the state. So not only the obvious ones, you have um, Camp Lejeune, Marine Corps Station, Cherry Point, what became Marine Corps Station, New River. And I, I hesitate to say that I don't know the extent of Graham Barden's reach, you know, what, what constituted the 3rd Congressional District in those days. But we have the Marine Division there, and Marines operate as combined arm, general purpose, task organized amphibious forces in readiness. Combined arms mean they have an aviation component, which prov provides a very important part of the combat effectiveness of a Marine Division. So where do we put that air facility now? The first criteria, obviously, that it be close to the base that they're going to support. They originally looked at Pamlico County and they said, no, let's put it on the other side of the Noose River. So they put it in Craven County, principal reasons being it had better access to the railroad and again to the port of Moorhead City. So Cherry Point was developed there. Oh, about five months after Camp Lejeune started, they started constructing Cherry Point. An air station trains 
a Marine Aircraft Wing, which is the equivalent of a Marine Division as far as the components go, Ground Force, Air Force. But the requirements for training the Air Wing were such that it could not all be handled at Cherry Point. So you want to talk about military facilities in eastern North Carolina. The training of the two air wings that were trained at Cherry Point also required the creation of another air station at Edenton and 10 other auxiliary air facilities which were located in Graham Barton's district. 10 other airfields, not as large as an air station, but an air facility that could handle groups and squadrons, whereas a wing or a Cherry Point, an air station was more oriented toward development of a wing, which is, wing is like a division on the air side. So we had Cherry Point. Cherry Point came into being. In those days, um, I guess maybe early 50s, late 40s, um, what type of, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Early 40s. Early 40s, yeah. Um, what type of aircraft did they mostly use? Was it the helicopters? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that was the dream. Yeah, you, you didn't see Air Forces or helicopters in the Marine Corps until after the war, after World War II. But the, the air facility at, air, at New River, which was originally called Camp Lejeune's Airport or Peterfield Point, eventually in its own right became an air station because of the capability and the amount and type of aircraft could handle. But during World War II, the type of aircraft that were trained at New River were a medium bomber, typically or more commonly known as a B-25, but in the naval services it was called a PBJ, a B-25 Mitchell, and dive bombers. Uh, one of the most famous of the war was the SBD, the Douglas Dauntless, trained there, and a few other cats and dogs. A little another aside, and I can't help mentioning taking pride in the Marine Corps and some of the unique features. You know what the V-1 was? You know, it was a, a jet-propelled, unguided missile that they fired off the north coast of Europe into Great Britain. They needed an aircraft and a unit capable of taking out those sites with a new rocket air-to-ground rocket they developed. They didn't ask the Navy, they didn't ask the Army Air Force, they asked a Marine Corsair unit to undertake that particular mission. Those aircraft trained in eastern North Carolina under the auspices of Cherry Point also. And another a unique feature about the air station at New River was they developed the first capability for nighttime low-level radar-directed attack against Japanese shipping, which proved to be quite effective also. So we have Marine Corps Air Station, New River eventually, but it didn't occur the era of the 40s. It was after that. It served in an auxiliary capacity. You have Cherry Point, Camp Lejeune, Marine Corps Station, Edenton, and those 10 other auxiliary facilities in North Carolina, which came under Cherry Point, which was utilized to train Marine Corps combat aircraft during World War II. Do you know who Tyrone Power is? Does that name ring a bell? You're too young. You should know who Tyrone Power is. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's one of the more famous male stars, uh, and he joined the Marine Corps. He wanted to be a glider pilot, but he was too old, so they ended up putting him in cargo aircraft, but he flew out of Cherry Point. One of the more noted uh, personalities is associated with the military facilities here in eastern North Carolina. That's... That explains how the Marines got here in eastern North Carolina. Now, I also mentioned, if you're interested, that talking about military facilities in general, a very large Army facility was 22 miles down the road, the main in containment being uh, on the other side of the road, tracks from Holly Ridge. And it was so large that at one point, at its peak strength, it probably had 60,000 people in it. And they had firing points. Uh, the furthest one down, they had a firing point at Fort Fish, and that 
Fort Fisher and they had one at Sears Landing to the just to the east on Topsail Island and three others. But as you might imagine, well I don't know if I told you this or not, it was an anti aircraft artillery training center. The Mar the Army developed a lot of those and I told you about the Marine Corps having to develop initially and Marine Corps initially had six divisions, but at the beginning the Rainbow series of plans only asked for two of them. Well, the others came along later as the requirement became uh, apparent. The Marine, uh, the Army developed 10 of these anti-aircraft artillery facilities because at the onset of the war, Axis air power was controlling the air and the Army thought they needed a massive anti-aircraft artillery capability to counter this Axis air power. Well, that Axis air power eventually went away. So from the formation of Camp Davis until 1940, they trained any aircraft artillerymen, but by 1944, that threat no longer existed. So they started closing these surplus any aircraft artillery training facilities. So the base basically went away in 1944, but not completely. Camp Lejeune actually owned Camp Davis for a period of time which they use principally to train uh, Royal Netherlands Marines. Okay. Which, amongst all the other things that Camp Lejeune accomplished, gave it the accolade of being the only American facility that trained the entire armed forces of a foreign nation in the United States. Wow. That's impressive. That also speaks a lot to their ability. Yeah. And there are several other accolades associated with Camp Lejeune. I don't know if that goes to the answer of how did we get here, but we did a lot of things which were of significance to the Marine Corps. Feel free, um, absolutely. I mean, that's just, boy, I think to me that's the most interesting of the, like what you were talking about earlier, there's mm -hmm. these nuggets where you think you just don't know, and you're, they live right down the road from history yeah. and don't even know it. Well, the five major tactical innovations of World War II, or not World, let's say the 20th century, there were five major tactical innovations. Camp Lejeune was involved with most of them. Camp Lejeune's had parachutists. Uh, the parachute assault was one of those tactical, if you might, when you think about innovations in wartime. Uh, Blitzkrieg, we didn't have anything to do with that. We can credit that to the Germans. But close air support. We were associated with that. The most important one, which was considered the most significant tactical innovation of World War II, principally because most of the more significant and successful land campaigns of the war were initiated by an amphibious assault, a doctrine developed by the Marine Corps, tested and refined here at Camp Lejeune. The impact of the military, specifically the Marines on Onslow County and Jacksonville, has been significant. If nothing else, just a look at the population. In Onslow County, there are 138,000 active duty or retired Marines, their families, and civilian employees. That's over half the population. There's no way they could not have a distinct influence on the character of this county. Um, if, and this is my perspective, I hope it doesn't offend too many people, had the Marines not come here, Jacksonville would be more like Sneeds Ferry and Swansboro. Since the Marines arrived here in 1940, the population of Jacksonville has increased 8,000%. When they built the first housing project here, and this wasn't a barracks, this was just a housing project. That one housing project had three times the population of the entire city of Jacksonville. I mean, it just got bigger for, with that. There is no way, there is in no area of interaction where the military and the civilian aren't working together in close cooperation and friendship. At one point, there was a certain amount of resentment when the Marines came because understandably a large number of the citizens had to be displaced to build this facility here. There's a variance in the numbers. You'd really have to go back and uh, it would be a considerable effort to determine specifically how many families were displaced, but let's say 500. 
The reason it's difficult is, you know, the records of deeds might indicate who owned the land, but the people that actually lived there weren't always the people that owned the land. About half of them were tenant farmers. So they really got screwed. Uh, you know, the people on the land said, oh, we weren't compensated enough for one thing or another. Uh, by and large, we were graciously welcomed here, although there was a lot of unhappiness because families have lived here since royal grants at the time of King George I. And it wasn't an easy thing to have to pull up and leave, and particularly on short notice. The tenant farmers had it even worse because the people that owned the land, when they sold their property to the Department of Justice, the owners would just go over and kick the tenant farmers out, and the tenant farmers would receive no pay for all the crops that worked on that year. Oof. And they were just displaced, and, you know, with no money in their pocket. So it was particularly tragic for them. So lingering, there are a lot of people that feel very badly about the fact that they were displaced, but I keep saying, would you rather have your children grown up speaking German and Japanese? It was a necessity. It was for our survival. We had to put together and constitute an armed forces that would defend our country. And there are two remarkable coincidences related to the coming of the Marines to this area, one of which is in the the approximately 111,000 acres which became the Federal Reservation. There were several communities, not just individual tenants and farmers that had to be displaced. The largest and most progressive community, which was located at Courthouse Bay, was called, believe it or not, Marines, North Carolina, which had been there prior to Camp, uh, Camp Lejeune, was even a twinkle in the Commandant's eye. That's a remarkable coincidence. The other thing that's remarkable is, of course, this is Onslow County, and the logo, the motto of Onslow County was Semper Fidelis, which of course is that of the Marine Corps. Who would have thunk it that you'd have those coincidences? And I have to say, and this is important, that people too many people are mispronouncing the name of this base. It's Camp Lejeune. The 13th Commandant of the United States' name was John Archer Lejeune. So you call the base Lejeune because that was his name. Uh, a, a lot of people are, aren't aware of that, even though we, we try to educate people in that regard. It's like uh, the existence of Marines or Semper Fidelis or a lot of other aspects associated with unique features and accomplishments of Camp Lejeune and the Marines in this area that are, that are not known. Um, the first Marines in the Onslow County area came here in 1777. They were embarked on a privateer brig called the Sturdy Beggar, which operated out of New Bern and sailed up and down the coast, uh, undertaking deprivations on British and shipping, that sort of thing. But the Daughters of the American Revolution recognized that in their research, and they said the first Marines in the Onslow area were aboard a detachment aboard the privateer brig Sturdy Beggar in 1777. Well, that seems like a reasonable question, but back at the, whenever it was in the 19th century or whatever, uh, when the powers that be deemed that the Marine Corps needed a motto, uh, more appropriate, um, I think, to, to their esprit. At that time, the motto of the Marine Corps was fortuity, and they thought it might be appropriate something more well, something more appropriate than Fortuna would be Semper Fidelis, so that became the motto of the Marine Corps. Well, that's all nautical symbolism, which we take. We, we've taken a lot of our traditions from uh, the Royal Marines, and the Royal Marines use uh, sim similar symbolism. The principal difference being that their globe is just on the Western Hemisphere. 
our globe is the entire earth indicating that uh, we have we have undertake roles that include the entirety of the earth not just the hemisphere that the royal marines claim Well, it's it's a it's a three dimensional eagle globe and anchor, and real marines call them eagle globe and anchors. Uh, the less uh, knowledgeable just call it an EGA, which is sort of a little bit disrespectful in our estimation. This is an eagle globe and anchor. It's not an EGA, but the you have the nautical symbol, especially the anchor, which is the, the nautical connection with the Marine Corps. And then you have the eagle with its talons out uh, in, in a warlike posture, indicating it is prepared to defend the United States wherever the service is required in your place in the world. So it, it's, it's not a dormant. It is in an attack mode. This is an exact model made out of silicon bronze of the 13-foot Eagle Globe and Anchor, which is over in the Lejeune Memorial Gardens the largest eel globe and anchor in the world. And while he was at it, he made a small number of replicas, of small ones. And since I was involved with that whole project to some degree, I got my foot in the door and got uh, the second one. The first one went to the Marine Corps Federal Credit Union, which provided us uh, considerably monetary assistance in helping us with putting our project together. And we haven't even talked about the Marine Corps Mu Carolina Museum of the Marine. No, we can. Briefly, that uh, it was an idea. A lot of people had thought that over the years, in fact, starting back in about 1942, somebody said, with the achievements of the Marines beginning in World War II, we really ought to have a museum which promotes those achievements and causes people to reflect upon what uh, the Marines, what we call the Carolina Marines, have accomplished and what they've given to their country and the sacrifices they've made. And it came into fruition beginning in, in 1999 uh, when a couple pioneers in the effort to, started the efforts to try to find the money that's necessary and, and the location for the museum. Now, initially, the Dart Department of Navy gave us the area which we call the Leisure Memorial Gardens over at the entrance to Montfort Point. And that's where we are through various administrations. Basically, our, um, we got Camp Lejeune to own the land on which the museum was going to be built. This facilitated our construction of the museum a great deal because then we didn't have to concern ourselves with the leases and rental of the land. So we had the land, and we had award-winning designs of what the museum was, how it was going to be constituted, and what its contents were going to be. And for the more majority of our existence since 1999, we've been trying to raise the money to build that museum, which entailed, uh, say, $26 million for a 40,000-square-foot museum. The citizens of Jacksonville and Onslow County and several others have been very generous in their contributions. But a hundred dollars here and a dime there, and it, it barely keeps the lights on. But finally, the, the, the representatives and, and the city and the county, I have to admit, have been very supportive also. But we finally were dry, getting national attention and the the General Assembly and the Senate of the state of North Carolina came around to appreciate that this, uh, not only for the functions as, as a Marine, but also as a tourist destination, would be very profitable for the area. And both houses put $26 million in the current budget for us to build that museum. To make that happen, and both houses have approved it. We just need Governor Cooper to sign the budget. Once Clumper, Governor Cooper signs that budget, then we will have our museum. And it is a museum and a civic institute.
so it's going to be uh, quite an attraction and a, a valuable addition to Jacksonville, Onslow County, Eastern North Carolina.